Re really great to, to have you. So again, this is the Fireside Chat with Lee Buchheit on Sovereign Debt, moderated by Maria Schweinberger. And with that, I'll just hand it over to Maria. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Jay. Very happy to be here. And thank you, everyone. And especially thank you to you, Lee, for joining us today. A brief word about myself. I'm a capital markets attorney in London. And I have been with INET and the Young Scholars Initiative for many years, and I'm very grateful for the mentorship and the sponsorship that I have and been given and provided for during this time. So we're gathering today around the virtual campfire for a conversation about the state of the world of sovereign debt. So we want to explore whether a global sovereign debt crisis is looming as a consequence of the COVID-19 shock and what's currently being done about it and what maybe can be done in the future or should be done about it in the future. Lee, our guest, is a former partner of Cleary Gottlieb Steen Hamilton, one of the most eminent American law firms. He has uh, over 40 years of experience in the world of sovereign debt and will not only be able to talk about what's going to happen next, but will also be able to speak about how these sovereign debt markets have evolved over the last 40 years in which he has represented nearly every country that has gone bankrupt since the 1980s. Um, just a brief word how this uh, chat ties in to our overall event. Um, we did not only invite Lee because um, Perry and Lee met at a dinner at the Central Bank of Argentina a while ago, but um, also and foremost, um, because the practice of sovereign debt restructuring is a perfect real world example of how the characteristics of money and credit as described in Perry's work um, play out in the real world. So the factual evidence and the real world experience that Lee brings to the table tie in very neatly with, with uh, Perry's scholarship and that is what we would like to explore today. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Lee, for your time and joining us today. And um, I, I thought we could keep this, this to a 90-minute event. And we'll start off with a, an interview-style Q&A between you and me for maybe something like 35, 40 minutes. And then we will open it up to the audience and take questions also for 35 to 40 minutes. And then we'll, we'll still have a buffer and we can see what we will do with that time. So, okay, thank you. So to kick this off, um, from your perspective, um, where do we currently stand in the world of sovereign debt after a very turbulent year of 2020? So we've seen a lot of countries scramble for cash. We saw two sovereign debt restructurings or possibly even more, probably even more, but Argentina and Ecuador are the first to come to mind. And we've seen two uh, G20 initiatives in 2020. Um, how do you make sense of this and where do you see that we, are, we currently stand? Great. Uh, th first, thank you, Maria, and thank you, folks. Uh, wonderful to be with you. We are at, unquestionably, a very unusual moment in the world of sovereign debt. Uh, since the financial crisis in uh, 2008, central banks have relentlessly driven down interest rates to the point that they are now <clears throat> in developed countries at zero or in some places are actually negative. That process has been accompanied by massive quantitative easing, which uh, essentially pushes liquidity into the financial markets, uh, which must be redeployed. Uh, the financial institutions are therefore under great pressure to find uh, investment opportunities that will return to them something resembling a remunerative yield. They cannot invest in US government treasuries or German bonds and expect to earn really any interest rate at all. Uh, and therefore, <clears throat> they must look for other opportunities. And in doing that, inevitably will have to, I don't want to say eclipse, I will say anesthetize their 
traditional and conventional risk aversion. So they will find riskier investments and be prepared to lend to them. Sovereign borrowers uh, in both the developed and developing worlds have been the beneficiaries of that process. Um, the markets have been remarkably open to many uh, sovereign borrowers, They're typically the higher rated ones. But we entered this pandemic with sovereign debt stocks in many countries, I would say most countries in the world, in both developed and developing uh, uh, areas at record highs. Now, that has not produced alarming newspaper headlines uh, as it might have in the past when we had sovereign debt crises, as we did in the 1980s, for example. It hasn't produced the alarmist reaction, principally as a function of zero interest rates. Mm -hmm. um, that has kept the cost of servicing these uh, colossal debt stocks uh, at levels that frankly are even lower than they were in the old days when the debt stocks were lower, but the interest rates were higher. The one thing that has happened over the last 40 years, and it has happened, I believe, insensibly, is that the market for sovereign debt instruments particularly emerging market sovereign debt instruments, has grown both liquid and very deep. 40 years ago, when the lenders to what we now call emerging market sovereigns were commercial banks, uh, they could not easily or at all sell their interests in the loans that they had made when they made a loan to the Republic of Ruritania for 10 years, they expected to be there to collect that loan at the end of the 10 years. There, there were very few, if any, opportunities for them uh, to sell their positions. Contrast that with what we have today. We have moved from commercial bank loans into bonds, bonds being the quintessentially liquid debt instruments, and investors today that buy a Republic of Ruritania bond in the morning can sell it in the afternoon. And that has, in my mind, dramatically changed how sovereign borrowing is done from both the debtors and the creditors standpoint, from the debtors standpoint. Uh, whereas 40 years ago, if the Republic of Ruritania had borrowed money from a commercial bank, it knew that it had to repay that debt during the term of the loan. It could not assume that there would be some market open to it to refinance that debt when it matured. And therefore, the loans were even structured typically as what are called amortizing loans, the principal was repaid gradually so that when the final maturity date occurred, there was a perfectly digestible amount left outstanding. No sovereign in this century borrows money with the expectation that it will have to repay it. If by repay it, you mean apply current resources to settle that claim, they borrow in the sure and certain hope that when that debt matures, they will be able to go back to the market and refinance it, borrow from someone else to pay back that loan. And when that debt matures, they'll do it again and do it again almost in perpetuity. And th that is a function, a gift, if you wish to see it that way, of the depth and liquidity of the sovereign debt markets today. But in that phenomenon is an enormous risk. And the risk is that these countries borrow uh, typically with 
so-called bullet repayments, that is the full amount of the debt is due on a single day in the future. If when you get to that day, for some reason, the markets are not open to the country or interest rates have crept back up to anything resembling their historic norms, uh, some of these countries are going to be in great difficulty. And that, I think, that's what I think of as the assumption of refinancing mm -hmm. is where the principal risk lies uh, as we move into this decade. Okay, so the, um, you've already mentioned some structural changes that we've seen in the sovereign debt markets in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and now specifically looking at 2020, right? We, we had a shock, we saw a shock in March, but then many of the sovereigns actually came back to the market and were able to, to issue quite a lot of debt. And um, maybe also unexpectedly, right? The market window hasn't really closed yet for most sovereigns. Or, um, so where do you think, um, when you look at what happened in the sovereign debt markets since March 2020, where, where, where do we stand there right now? Okay. Uh, what happened in 2020 was fascinating. When the pandemic uh, hit and it's duration and severity were of course uh, impossible to predict. The credit markets pulled back from emerging markets. We had what the economists call a sudden stop. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially all lending ceased and something like $90 billion poured out of emerging markets in March. At that point, the uh, managing director of the IMF and the president of the World Bank Group came out with a statement <clears throat> directed at the G20 countries, which said that they encouraged the G20 countries to provide temporary debt relief to the group uh, of, uh, of the poorest countries in the world, as the World Bank taxonomy <laughs> categorizes countries, these are the poorest, in the end, it turned out to be 73 countries. The G20 responded to that very uh, quickly and to my eyes, very commendably uh, by coming out with what they call the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the DSSI. It said that debt service payments due to bilateral government creditors for the balance of 2020 uh, would be deferred over a relatively short period of time, uh, four years or so. Um, and they called upon commercial creditors to give the same temporary debt relief. Now, what was significant about the DSSI is that China, now the world's largest bilateral creditor, is in the G20. Traditionally, the OECD countries have renegotiated their emerging market sovereign credits collectively under something called the Paris Club. It, it is an informal group of OECD countries. They just, they meet under the auspices of the French treasury. Uh, China is not a member of the Paris Club, although it, <clears throat> it observes it for years. The Paris Club has been hoping to bring China in because they are now the dominant bilateral lender. <clears throat> so the DSSI was viewed with approval by the official sector because it seemed to signal that China would at least coordinate its debt restructuring activities uh, with, the, with the Paris Club countries. <laughs> what then happened, you've alluded to. The sudden stop in March stopped 
rather suddenly, <laughs> and the markets reopened to many of these countries, not all of them, mind you, uh, mm -hmm. the, the higher rated emerging market sovereigns were able to issue uh, bonds again. Uh, uh, and <clears throat> the private sector lenders, the commercial lenders, while they had been called upon to match uh, the uh, debt relief being provided by bilateral creditors uh, uh, thought up a lot of reasons why they didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And their argument principally was that if you require commercial lenders to provide debt relief, that will trigger ratings downgrades by the credit rating agencies, which will make it impossible or at the very least more expensive for some of these sovereigns to be able to go back to the market. So if you were a finance minister in one of these 73 countries and you thought uh, either you had bond market access or thought you might have it, uh, you had a very difficult decision. <laughs> mm. Do you ask for DSSI debt relief, perhaps at the expense of losing access to the market, which of course would provide far more immediate liquidity to the country, uh, or <clears throat> do you uh, take uh, what uh, the G20 has offered uh, and uh, hope that uh, there won't be ramifications in terms of your uh, credit uh, ratings. And that is how 2020 uh, unfolded. The commercial creditors in the end did not participate in the DSSI. The G20 extended the DSSI for the first six months of this year. So it will now run out in June of this year. I fully expect it will be extended until the end of the year. What has happened in March, oh, strike that, in, in November of last year, was that the G20 realized that there will be a group of countries, and by the way, of the 73 countries eligible to participate in the DSSI, only 46 have done so. Uh, the others fall into that category where, uh, yeah. It, it, it is apparent to everyone <laughs> that this temporary deferment, not forgiveness, deferment of debt service payments under the DSSI will not be sufficient for a number of countries to return them to a sustainable debt position. And therefore, they will require a more durable debt restructuring in 2021 or 2022. Uh, the G20 came out with a separate pronouncement uh, known as the Common Framework, in which they said that in those full-scale debt restructurings, there would be a degree of coordination between the Paris Club and, uh, and non-Paris Club creditors, read China. Um, they did not try to establish a template for how the, the, those transactions would be structured as they had done twice in the past, once in the early 1990s under the, uh, under the, the banner of the so-called Brady Initiative and later on in the 1990s for the poorest countries, the highly indebted poor country initiative. They did not attempt to establish a template, but they said, uh, if countries need uh, durable debt relief, uh, they will be expected to go to the IMF to have an IMF program and then to negotiate with their official sector creditors. But this time, uh, the common framework said that any debt relief provided by bilateral creditors will come together with a requirement of comparable treatment 
by commercial creditors. Now that has long been a, 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 a requirement of the Paris Club. If a country obtains debt relief from the Paris Club, the OECD bilateral creditors, they must agree that they will seek comparable treatment understood in a net present value sense from their non-Paris Club bilateral creditors and commercial creditors. And the, G, the, 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 the G20 common framework document goes out of its way to say <laughs> to, the, to the private sector uh, investor universe, you escaped and evaded the DSSI, uh, but you will not escape and evade uh, debt restructurings under this common framework. Now we have the first two countries that have sought uh, debt restructurings uh, this year under that framework and this issue. Will an effective method of corralling or roping in uh, private sector creditors be found? Uh, so that, that's essentially where we are right now. Okay, so I'm going to um, take this step by step. So let's mm -hmm. zoom in a little bit on the G20 framework, right? So one of the things I'm interested in understanding better is um, why is it so important to have a framework or you even mentioned a template for restructurings, right? Um, in the 1980s, I understand there was a template for restructurings and maybe you can explain um, why, why this is important and how this facilitates the restructuring process. Um, this is the, yeah, maybe this is the first question. And then let's talk more about private public and debt sustainability. But maybe let's first talk about the template and, and how this is actually helpful. Okay. A template was developed in the 1980s. There were some 27 countries that had to restructure their external debt in that period. <clears throat> it was not a template programmed by the official sector in the sense that the official sector said, here's what you must do. It was rather a function that the creditor group at that period was homogenous. Okay. They were all commercial banks. <clears throat> and the first country <clears throat> that entered the process in 1982, Mexico, established a program in which uh, the various elements of the debt restructuring were set out. And that program was then replicated with very few modifications by essentially every other country that came along uh, during that decade. <clears throat> At the end of that period, when there was a shift in policy, certainly by the US government, which said that uh, commercial bank creditors would have to accept losses on their sovereign portfolio in order to have some chance <clears throat> of returning these countries to sustainable debt positions. At that point, the official sector <clears throat> offered to lend the money to the emerging market countries uh, to allow them to buy collateral to pledge to secure new bonds known as Brady bonds that would essentially take out their old commercial bank exposure, but at a discount. Uh, and in that instance, <clears throat> the official sector really did establish the template. Uh, mm -hmm. And they did it because they were prepared to lend the money uh, to allow the debtor countries to do it. Later on, in the highly indebted poor country initiative, this was something available to the, the 33 poorest countries in the world that allowed them <clears throat> essentially to write off the vast majority of both their bilateral, multilateral, and commercial debt. Uh, there too, there was an established program. <clears throat> this time, uh, they are not in the common framework saying a country that wants uh, debt relief uh, must do the following or issue the following types of debt instruments or <clears throat> obtain the following amount of debt relief. It will be, to use the jargon, case by case. 
the assumption is there are some assumptions built into the common framework. One is that you'll have an IMF program. Uh, second, that you will go to the Paris Club. Mm -hmm. And that non Paris Club bilateral creditors, read China, will <coughs> coordinate, uh, mm -hmm. by which I assume we are to mean will provide debt relief at the same level, although not perhaps in precisely the same way. And because of the comparable treatment requirement, uh, the sovereign debtor will be obliged to go to its commercial creditors and seek comparable in a net present value sense debt relief to that that has been provided by the Paris Club. So let's zoom in on this a little bit on the, on the private sector par participation. You already mentioned that in 2020, the private sector was not willing at all to give any participation. Although in the beginning, I understand in April, May, they had signaled the, the Institute of International Finance who represents the creditor countries um, had signaled that they would be willing um, to give at least some. So why did they come out of not giving any participation um, so far? And um, I mean, what, what do you expect to happen in 2021? I mean, why would their willingness be greater now or um, will it remain at zero? Okay, well, <laughs> you've asked uh, uh, the burning question of the day. The reasons that the private sector advanced for their unwillingness or they would say reluctance to provide the debt relief under the DSSI were these. Uh, first, <laughs> they argued, <clears throat> it is for many countries a self-inflicted wound. Uh, the rating agencies came out, some of them had said that were an emerging market country to seek a debt relief from its commercial creditors under the DSSI, that would be a factor justifying a downgrade uh, mm -hmm. of that sovereign, <clears throat> and that frightened many finance ministers uh, into refraining from even asking. And indeed, <clears throat> the commercial creditors will tell you they have rarely been asked to provide mm -hmm. debt relief. So that was the first argument. It's a self-inflicted wound for the debtor countries. Second argument was <clears throat> these institutions uh, invest other people's money. Uh, they are pension funds, they are hedge funds, uh, they are sovereign wealth funds. Uh, they have a fiduciary duty, they mm -hmm. argued, to maximize the amount uh, that they can extract from their investments and that it would be inconsistent with that fiduciary duty, they argued, uh, to voluntarily forego uh, receipt of payments that would otherwise uh, be coming in. Final argument was <clears throat> on a globally net basis, uh, the participation of commercial creditors in the debt stocks of these poorest countries, the 73 poorest countries, the commercial creditors have no more than 20 or 25 percent of those debt stocks. It is mostly, as you might expect, multilateral, IMF, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, etc., uh, and bilateral government credits. Uh, and therefore, the contribution in dollar terms that commercial creditors might have made to the DSSI was going to be proportionally smaller uh, than other types of creditors. And on a globally net basis, they said, uh, we, the market, continue to be open for many of these creditors. So we commercial creditors are pumping out as fresh money far more uh, than, uh, uh, than would have been saved uh, had we simply deferred for the balance of 2020 the debt service payments due to us. Now that, uh, uh, the, that is a fragile assertion, of course, because while it may be true on a global basis, uh, if you look at 
the emerging market countries that have gone to the bond market in 2020, they have tended to be the higher rated ones. Uh, and so you've got a, a slug of poor countries uh, that have had to face this odious choice uh, do they suspend service on their external debt at the expense of bruising their credit reputation um, or, and spend that money on COVID amelioration expenses? Uh, or uh, do they continue to pay their external debt, but at the expense of being able to provide health care coverage for their citizens? That is an odious position. For a country to be in, and that is precisely uh, what the G20 was trying to avoid by having a DSSI in the beginning. Okay, let's um, talk a little bit more about creditor diversity. It seems to me that this is the main difference um, of today's situation and the situation in the 1980s. So we had mostly commercial banks who were creditors in the 1980s, and to some extent, the, the, the interest of these banks aligned, whereas today we have multilateral organizations, governments, we have bondholders of all kinds, mostly asset managers or funds, but we also have uh, new governments or new players like China. Mm -hmm. So um, where do you see, um, I mean, if we talk about diversity a little bit more, um, I thought most of the bonds outstanding today have collective action clauses. So very different from what these instruments were structured in the structured like the, the loans were structured in the 1980s. So wouldn't it be possible because these uh, collection, collective action clauses are in the bonds to find some way or another to align the interests of these creditors and then sort of have an, a de a debt, obtain debt relief a little bit more easier or easily? Collective action clauses came into emerging market sovereign bonds uh, only starting in 2003. Uh, and while they were a significant innovation, uh, I fully agree with that. Um, they had real limitations. First, in the form of collective action clause that appears in most sovereign bonds, the clause operates only within the four corners of that bond. Uh, and it requires holders of 75% of the outstanding principal to agree to a debt restructuring of that bond. What that means in practice is that a determined holdout creditor, non-participating creditor, or a group of creditors that acquire 26% of the, of the, of the bond can with arithmetic certainty ensure that they will never be crammed down by a collective action clause. Best example, Greece. Uh, Greece uh, in its debt restructuring of 2012 had 35 English law bonds, each with a traditional collective action clause. They called bondholder meetings for all 35 syndicates, but only 17 joined. Holdouts had gotten blocking positions in the others, and that showed the weakness. Now, in 2015, we tried to uh, revise and enhance collective action clauses to make them uh, aggregated, that is to say, uh, voting under certain circumstances for a debt restructuring will be by all bondholders, under all series, mm -hmm. uh, rep replicating, if you're familiar with it, the class voting structure that you see in Chapter 11 in the United States and in, 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 in many other corporate insolvency regimes. And frankly, that's what we're trying to do is replicate to the extent we can through contractual mechanisms, uh, features of corporate insolvency regimes uh, like class uh, class voting, but those enhanced clauses are still in a minority of sovereign bonds. That's, that's the first um, uh, problem. The second problem is <laughs> we have no, I repeat, we have no 
uh, mechanism, contractual mechanism, or for that matter, institutional mechanism, uh, that will coordinate different types of creditors. So a sovereign that has bonds, okay, they may have collective action clauses, they may, may even have aggregated collective action clauses, fine. Uh, but if they have bank loans, which they probably will, those are untouched by the collective action mechanism. If they have suppliers credits, if they've taken money from commodity traders, uh, if they have bilateral loans, all of these are separate pockets of creditors with no institutional method, no bankruptcy code, as mm -hmm. a corporate debtor could have, that will rope them into and force them to coordinate in a workout process, nor do we have any contractual mechanism that reaches across these different creditor groups. And therein is a major problem. In 2002, right after the Argentine default, uh, <laughs> that Argentine default, uh, the IMF uh, 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 proposed something called a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, uh, which was nothing less than a transnational bankruptcy code. And we worked on that for a couple of years to see if it could, it could be made to work. Uh, in the end, it died a political death. Uh, the Americans uh, were not prepared to support it, and they threw their weight behind the introduction of collective action clauses. Uh, but as I say, the collective action clauses, while undoubtedly helpful, uh, uh, are, ha ha have real limitations in terms of their efficacy in dealing with a sovereign's entire debt stock. Um, let's talk a little bit about Iraq and the Iraqi restructuring. So I understand what was different about Iraq is that the United Nations Security Council immunized Iraq's principal assets, external assets. And that's why um, private creditors were not able to enforce their claims on, that, on these assets that were outside of Iraq. So um, did that facilitate the Iraqi uh, debt restructuring? And why um, is it not possible to replicate that now? Uh, You're laughing. Okay. No, no, you accurately describe it. Yeah. But yeah. I think uh, we should all recognize that was the one and only time that the Security <laughs> Council has taken that step. The situation of Iraq in 2003 uh, Saddam had been removed. <laughs> uh, there was a coalition of countries led by the United States that had an army in Iraq. Uh, there were grave concerns about the security situation of Iraq and uh, the recovery of Iraq's economy. The country, remember, had, had gone through two wars, one at the time of the Kuwait invasion in 1990, but then again uh, to oust Saddam. The economy, the infrastructure was terribly degraded. Um, and so there was considerable geopolitical support for trying to get Iraq back on its feet. That is, of course, a notoriously fragile area of the world, and 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 an unstable Iraq was thought uh, to contribute uh, to global problems. Put it that way. Uh, the Security Council, and remember that the five permanent members of the Security Council need to concur in these sorts of decisions. So you're talking about a situation in which China and Russia and the United States uh, uh, all were prepared to do this, passed a resolution under what's called chapter seven of the UN charter. That is the one chapter which says that a resolution of the Security Council uh, is binding 
upon all members of the United Nations. And what the Security Council did was it encouraged the new administration, the post-Saddam administration in Iraq to renegotiate the Saddam era debts, which totaled about $140 billion. Um, and it, Im, as you said, immunized from attachment, to quote the resolution, from all forms of judicial process, Iraqi oil assets and the proceeds from oil assets, and that's 95% of Iraq's economy. Um, and yes, <laughs> while a creditor still theoretically could go to a domestic court and get a judgment against Iraq, uh, that judgment uh, really only has value to the holder if they can find some asset against which to levy to pay themselves back. And the Security Council had wrapped this immunity around the entire world. It was done for that instance, and, and this, the, the debt restructuring for Iraq was quite successful. Uh, it was, its terms were savage on the creditors. It inflicted an 89.75% net present value loss for all the creditors. So it was pretty savage. Uh, but the question is, would the Security Council be prepared to do that again? Uh, I think only in a situation that commands a very high level of geopolitical concern. Uh, people speak about Venezuela as a possibility, a post-Maduro Venezuela. Um, but there are, uh, I have to say, grave concerns, uh, even within the United Nations, that the Security Council not not be seen to be acting as a world legislature. Because mm -hmm. you see, that resolution, <laughs> if, you, if you want to be lurid about it, overrode 500 years of Anglo-American jurisprudence on the enforcement of contracts and creditor rights. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about pretty explosive stuff, putting apart the question uh, that I will not speak to of whether in, in the atmosphere of 2021, one could expect to get all five permanent members of the Security Council voting in, in agreement uh, on a matter of geopolitical significance. So I don't, honestly, I don't think we're likely to see that replicated anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm going to ask you two more questions before I open it up to the mic and um, to, to the audience. Um, first one, let's talk about debt sustainability. You yeah. already said that um, the, the assumption that it's made in the G20 framework that we're going to see applied going forward, very likely to see applied going forward. The assumption, one of the assumptions is that a, a debtor country will enter an IMF program. Yeah. Um, I understand the first step in the IMF program is for the IMF to analyze or to, to make a debt sustainability analysis. Um, so why, why is that the classic role of the IMF? And um, then I understand that the IMF, or well, I don't, the IMF has often been criticized for the way in which the debt sustainability analysis is done. And in our current world with um, very high political, but also um, COVID-19 uncertainty, it is extremely difficult to make, a, a, to make an exact um, or to say a feasible analysis of debt sustainability. So where do you see the issues here? What do you think um, how the situation can be um, approached and what is most sensible in, yeah. in, in debt sustainability analysis? The the, the IMF has traditionally done the debt sustainability analyses. Uh, they're the only organization on the planet that could plausibly claim both the technical competence to do that, they've done it hundreds of times, uh, but also the political legitimacy to do it. After all, 
most countries are members of the IMF. And therefore, this is not uh, a group of external players, creditors or someone telling the country what it needs to do. This is an organization to which the debtor country itself belongs and has a voice. So that, that's the theory of it. Debt sustainability analyses, because they are forward looking, uh, must make assumptions about uh, what the country's economy is going to look like, what the world economy will look like, what monetary policy will look like. Uh, look, those predictions looking out two or three years are educated guesses. Mm -hmm. Looking out seven, 10, 12, 20 years, uh, they're wildly speculative. Uh, and yet that is what <laughs> the debt sustainability analysis has to do. And that was, and that was true pre-pandemic. Uh, that's always been true. Mm -hmm. The pandemic, of course, is a phenomenon that we have not seen in a hundred years. Uh, there are no historical precedents that would inform someone like the IMF in predicting when the pandemic will abate, uh, how quickly will the world economy recover, um, uh, what will be the reaction uh, of monetary authorities and, 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 and all the rest of it. Those are things for which they cannot look to history and uh, for any guidance. And that adds yet another element of uncertainty to it. All of that said, there is no alternative. <laughs> uh, you, if you're going to ask creditors for debt relief based upon the country's need for debt relief this year, next year, the year after, 10 years from now, somebody is going to have to uh, make a prediction of how much debt relief is needed. This is one of the central problems in sovereign debt restructuring, and it is becoming more acute every year. What, what, the market is trying to do is figure out mechanisms that will allow the terms of a sovereign debt workout to be adjusted if when we get to the future, it turns out that the financial terms of the debt restructuring either were undershooting, that is sought debt relief at uh, less debt relief than the country turns out to have needed, or overshooting, uh, extracted more debt relief from today's creditors than turns out to have been necessary to return the country to a sound financial footing in the future. They're looking for mechanisms that will allow an adjustment to the terms to take into those, uh, take into account those factors. We're not very skilled in that craft at the moment, uh, but people are trying to do it. And I, and I think the aggravated uncertainties that flow from the pandemic and the uncertainties that that will engender in post COVID uh, uh, de uh, debt sustainability analyses, uh, I think will add fuel to that fire. Okay, thank you. So last question from my side before I open it up to the group. Um, in Perry's work, one of his specialties, I would say, is uh, tracing the intellectual biography of important thinkers or central bankers. And um, so I, I want to ask you about um, important influences on your career and your thinking. Is there a book or a mentor that you want to point to? And then also, I'm very interested in how did you end up um, being the counsel to the sovereigns? When did you get your first call from a treasury secretary and how did this come about? Okay. The answer to the first question is um, there has been 
a, a dramatic change in the world of sovereign debt on the legal side. It was only in 1976, so the blink of an eye historically, that the United States passed uh, legislation called the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, which for the first time in history gave creditors to sovereigns a legal remedy. Before that, they had only a diplomatic remedy. If you lent money to the Republic of Ruritania and they didn't pay you, your remedy was to go to the foreign office to the State Department to the Quai d'Orsay and make a speech about those rascals in Ruritania and I want Her Majesty's diplomatic pressure brought to bear upon them. That was your remedy. Uh, but in the last quarter of the 20th century, all of a sudden, creditors were given a judicial remedy, both in the United States and it was quickly followed uh, in, in most other countries. And, there, and I entered this process. I started practicing law in that year, <laughs> a few weeks after they passed that legislation. But uh, when the debt crisis broke out in 1982, uh, honestly, there were no precedents. Sure, there had been sovereign debt crises in the past. The last one had been in the 1930s uh, 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 during the Depression. But those people did not have judicial remedies. Uh, and therefore, their workout practices were to us, uh, I won't say obsolete, they were just not really very relevant from the legal standpoint. Uh, and this now goes to your second question. Uh, my firm had the great good fortune of advising Mexico in that period. And uh, when Mexico, which was the first country to enter into the global debt crisis of the 1980s, uh, they approached my former firm for uh, legal assistance. And I was brought on the team as a young lawyer. Uh, I quickly realized that I was present at the creation of an entire practice area. Uh, it, there, there was no one alive who remembered how any of this had been done. And even if they had remembered it, it had been done in a largely extra legal environment. And that was the first realization. The second realization was as that year, 1982, went on into 1983, country after country after country fell into the same problem. They were all afflicted by the same problem, which is they had borrowed from commercial banks on a floating rate interest basis. And Paul Volcker, to deal with double digit inflation in the United States, <laughs> raised interest rates to the point that in 19, late 1981, LIBOR topped out at 22% per annum. So they were all uh, sucked down into this problem. Uh, and it occurred to me, one might just be able to make a career out of it. Um, and that was the second feature. The third feature was because there was honestly, no law. Uh, the job, while it had a small legal component, it included a significant political component, geopolitical component, public relations component. Uh, honestly, I spent more of my time drafting speeches and press releases for finance ministers and central bank governors than I ever did drafting legal documents. Uh, and all of that appealed to me. Uh, my relationship with the law has always been on a need to know basis. Uh, and so this type of work appealed to me. And I, I just decided to make it my life's work and I don't regret it at all. It provided 
a fascinating career uh, uh, where you deal with countries all around the world, every one of them different, both in terms of their financial picture, of course, but more importantly, different in a cultural sense. Um, and, and, and maybe this is the final point I'll make, from the lawyer standpoint, there's a special bond that you have with a client when the client is at the nadir of its fortunes, when their back is against the wall and the only friend they have in the whole world is you. Uh, you bond with a client in that way that you never can in times of prosperity. Uh, I fear that in times of prosperity, clients look at us poor lawyers as a commodity, relatively fungible. Well, if it weren't you, it'd be Maria. And if it wasn't Maria, it'd be Tom or Dick or Harry. And you're all more or less interchangeable. Uh, we lawyers, and I'm speaking to one, uh, loathe that. <laughs> we don't like to think of ourselves as fungible or as a commodity. And so this type of work um, really ensured uh, <laughs> that I, I never had to see a client in a moment of prosperity. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'm obviously also go show, shouting out to my team from Millbank, who is uh, on the line. Um, thank you very much for joining and for the kind of support you're providing in this very moment. And I want to open up uh, the mic to the audience um, and for more questions. Um, we have, I would say, about an hour. Um, maybe Perry, do you want to come forward with a first question and then people either raise their hand or type their, type here in the in the chat and I will call you and then you can um, ask the question live. Thank you. Sure, uh, I, I will I will kick it off. Um, are you hearing me? Yes. The, um, uh, this is just, uh, thank you very much. This is a fascinating uh, uh, glimpse in, inside the negotiating rooms, I guess. Um, what I want to do is to uh, tease out the money flow dimension here uh, a little bit more. Um, as it happens just last Wednesday, I, I, you may know, or certainly every, most people here in this room know, that it's my practice in teaching my class to start with an impromptu FT lecture. And last, as it happens, last, F, last Wednesday, I gave one, there was an article in the FT about Ethiopia um, and their problems with debt relief and so forth. So it's on the top of my mind. And I, yeah. uh, if I was talking to graduate students, I have a whole balance sheet structure to explain, but I will do it verbally. The, and I, it seems to me that this is a, so this is my paradigmatic case at the moment because it's fresh in my mind. And, and yeah. so I think there's sort of a couple of things that I would point out to really draw the links with the money view. Um, that uh, first of all, we're talking about countries that are in a transition of financial development that as you, I just wanna highlight what you, what you said that most of these countries, if they're very poor, they don't have access to capital markets. And so they rely on multilateral creditors or on bilateral official creditors for which are only interested in helping these countries typically for geopolitical reasons. Um, and, uh, but the idea, if you're successful at this, is that this will create a track record, okay, that will then make it possible to go to the commercial markets. And you want to do that because that's where the big money is. Okay, so you, and, and also where there's relatively less politics, you know, where you're, you're borrowing from somebody mm -hmm. who just wants you to pay the money back. You know, they don't want you to be their friend in the UN or anything, you know, they, they just want you. To, and so it's, it's, it's a cleaner relationship that you're trying to move toward. Um, and all of these countries that you're dealing with are in the middle of that trajectory. Some of them have started also with state-led uh, state-led development so that these are sovereign debts, okay? Some of them are making a transition to increased private, so these are quasi-sovereign debts. They're the debts of the national champion oil company or something like that, okay? 
in many cases, these are dollar debts. Okay, now here we're getting to the point, okay, where the country needs to, in order to pay this back, it needs to earn dollars. So it needs uh, exports um, and it need, and, and many of the development needs it has aren't particularly gonna add to this. So you, you, it would be nice if you had a coffee export that you could use you could you could basically monetize that or you know capitalize that and borrow against that for your foreign so that so the balance of payments problem for these countries from this is again just linking it to the money view framework is the survival constraint okay that you that that that's where the rubber hits the road here um and that's what leads to the sudden stop or that's why the sudden stop is so dangerous that that suddenly you can't buy anything you know, you're, 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 you have a binding survival constraint and you're out of the situation. So you're very vulnerable. You were, you, you made the point to, if you, if you, to, to rolling over your debt, if you're depending on rolling on over your debt, you're, you're in a problem, um, but also you're vulnerable to COVID crisis, you know, which suddenly, you know, creates this shock. Um, and so there are kind of two problems that these countries are faced. They want to live to the end of the COVID crisis and then resume their development. So they, they don't want to, and that's their problem. And it is a liquidity problem, maybe a solvency problem. Okay. And, and, and so, so that's by way of just setting up the economic background. And, and let me say, and so I'm not going to ask a question. What we what I what we hear is that in this last COVID crisis, um, in some of the uh, better off emerging market countries, the central banks um, were very effective in somehow um, facilitating the run on their on their uh, uh, you know this this capital outflow without caught without allowing collapse of their currency or collapse of their domestic economy. So that this and that this was a new thing. This is a new thing in the COVID crisis that hasn't happened before. Um, I imagine that this is, you know, this is something that is you you need debtor in possession financing or something to to. Uh, and so that's my question really is about you. You're you're trying to make an analogy between corporate bankruptcy and sovereign bankruptcy and realizing like we're not even close. Okay, my question is who takes care of the balance payments? Um, while while you're negotiating with all these folks and trying to get them get them to the table, um, and uh, and is that a is are there cards to play? Okay, in 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 that regard. Okay, uh, the answer is uh, uh, got a number of elements to it. I think. Um, you're right, there is no debtor in possession financing in the sovereign sense, uh, except that as a matter of convention, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of convention, lending by the multilateral institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the regional multilateral development banks are regarded as preferred and therefore money coming in from them will be treated as non-restructurable. So that's probably the closest that you have to a dip financier in the context of a, uh, of a sovereign uh, world. Uh, it's, it's very interesting, and I've seen historians make this point many times. Of the 27 countries that went through the global debt crisis in the 1980s and early 1990s, a number of them were <laughs> inoculated. Uh, uh, they learned a lesson from that experience uh, or lessons. Uh, one lesson was uh, that borrowing in a foreign currency has a lot of inherent risks to it. Um, borrowing on a floating rate basis in a foreign currency is even more risky. Um, and so you have had a number of countries uh, that have shifted very significantly their borrowing to their domestic markets when they've had a, 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 a local capital market. Um, uh, and uh, traditionally in the bond market where they borrow now, fixed interest rates are far more prevalent. It's pretty rare that you see a floating rate sovereign bond. Uh, and so, 
those countries that were inoculated by the last major debt crisis uh, were able to enter future periods of turmoil. And we've had several. We had them in the late 70s in East Asia and in Russia. Uh, obviously, we've had uh, defaults like Argentina in, 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 in this century. Also, and it goes to your question of uh, uh, how one tides oneself over a period of, call it market arthritis, uh, where you're not shut off, but the market is not prepared to lend freely and is, is looking uh, for what may be uh, too high an interest rate for the lending. Uh, one way of, of being able to bridge that is through a generous reserve position. Most countries, I'm afraid, uh, have international reserves that in the face of a true sudden stop uh, would uh, allow them to continue normal debt service for a matter of weeks or months. Uh, but some countries uh, have built up their reserve positions and if the market turns arthritic uh, for a while, they can try to ride it out. The final recourse, however, is capital controls. I mean, that's, uh, that's the sovereign debtor's last argument. Um, the sovereign debtor will default on its own obligations, but through the imposition of capital controls effectively force uh, its corporate debtors uh, to restructure their foreign currency denominated obligations unless those corporates have either external assets or, or FX denominated revenue streams that they can use for that purpose. And even there, the sovereign, if they want to draft a truly uh, a powerful capital control can force those corporates to sell all their FX wherever located in the world to the central bank for local currency. But that's effectively how how they do it if they have to do it. But you know, the IMF has for years uh, disfavored capital controls. Uh, they are easy to put in place sometimes, but awfully difficult to wean yourself from them once they're there. And as you may recall, we had them, we had to have them in Greece, you know, uh, uh, Greece, imposing capital controls in the middle of a monetary union was something that we hadn't seen before. Uh, Cyprus had to do it in 2013. So that's in the end. But uh, what will happen in the extreme case is the country will simply declare a moratorium or impose a de facto moratorium for its own, that is its sovereign and state-owned instrumentality uh, obligations and through capital controls uh, re regulate the availability of foreign exchange to its corporate debtors. That conserves the foreign exchange in the country. Uh, nothing is going to be coming in until the debt restructuring is done. And to the extent that there is fresh financing, it's coming from these preferred creditors like the IMF. Thank you. Okay, so I think Oscar is next. Um, I have a bunch of people here. Um, I'm going to call on you individually. Um, Oscar is the first one. Or maybe we can take a few questions, right? So we let's take Oscar, Ritwick, and Larissa's questions, and then um, Lee answers, and then we take the next bunch. Does that work? Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I think my question ties in in the follow-up of this. Uh, I'm dialing in from Iceland and I can tell you, you're a national hero here still since the <laughs> restructuring and the capital controls we got. But uh, my question is not on that, but, but, but obviously that creates a, a, a triangle I'm thinking, like comparing, you have a advanced economy, you know, in a banking crisis, putting up capital controls, getting fine out of it. Then you have Greece, 
you know, advanced economy, but not as rich or prominent as the, where I am. And then if you can compare that with the, what we are focusing on here, the, the global south or, or where the problem is now, as I see it, and not only in, in, in uh, government debt, but also state-owned enterprises. Uh, so I'm thinking uh, here we got loans, but on six, 7% interest rate, you know, mm. I don't know what the rate was in Greece. So do you see it? In, in these coming turbulent years where this needs to be restructured, do you see it as the market can, could see it as a potential for good yield in, in the global south? Or okay. you see a zero interest rate environment like uh, you know helping these countries to get out of it on a lower rate? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. I'm Ritvik and then Larissa. Yeah, hi. Uh, my question is actually quite simple, which is, um, I have uh, has Lee come across any sort of instances of um, restructuring required in local currency debt? So is it always actually hot currency debt? But also a question of uh, local currency debt. I do have one small uh, thing on, uh, on Perry's question, actually. So I think there are two other further ways in which the BOP constraint is solved in the middle of a refinancing. One is simply the crash of imports, which is actually quite... Uh, quite uh, visible in, in the COVID crisis. And the other is a uh, repo to term transaction where you can have the government uh, issue new bonds that the central bank takes on its balance sheet. And then a financial institution uh, funds the central bank against those bonds in dollars. So, so. Okay, Larissa, do you want to come on before Lee answers these questions? I um, can't hear you yet. You're still oh. mute. Yes. All right. No. Um, so two two questions. I would love to hear more about what are the mechanisms and institutions that bondholders come together under the clause you were mentioning and what was the history of and setup for that? And also, are there currently any mobilization to organize around a global bankruptcy court, as you were mentioning, or has that been or is that the efforts currently on pause? Okay, uh, let me take those in the order. Uh, Oscar first. Um, look, the reason that some emerging markets countries have been able to finance themselves over the course of the last year in the face of the shrieking uncertainties that the pandemic has imposed, uh, it is principally uh, a desire for yield by the investor community. Uh, <laughs> these investors, the whole financial system has been force-fed liquidity like a Paragore goose with its beak propped open and it's being force-fed in order to get a fatty liver. That is the financial system <laughs> that we've had for the last year. Uh, they have had to look for opportunities to invest it at some kind of yield, and therefore the countries have benefited uh, from that. But there is historically a grave risk. Uh, there's a popular misconception that sovereigns like to restructure their debt or that they default casually. Uh, that is a fallacy. If history says anything, it is that sovereigns evince a pathological procrastination in their willingness to deal with their debt problems. Uh, why? Because debt problems never come in isolation. <laughs> There's usually a banking crisis, a trade crisis, a currency crisis, a social crisis, a political crisis. No right-thinking politician wants to hurl him or herself into that vortex lightly. Um, and in the desire sometimes to try to avoid a debt restructuring, a sovereign invisible distress will be the recipient of financing proposals from various groups uh, that frankly uh, uh, are on ruinous terms. 
uh, whether uh, the interest rate or the request for the pledge of collateral security uh, or the purchase of external guarantees. But from the standpoint of a politician, uh, some politicians will say, if this will avoid, if this will let me put this cup from my lips for another eight months, that's an eternity. Uh, and so, yes, there is a grave risk uh, that these countries, in their effort to defer or they hope avoid entirely the uh, uh, unpleasantry of a debt restructuring, may find themselves incurring obligations on ruinous terms that eventually then have to get sorted out uh, in the debt restructuring. Second question, yes, there are occasionally restructurings of local currency debt instruments. The most prominent recent one was last year Barbados, which had half of its debt stock in local currency was obliged to restructure that debt stock. Most countries, however, uh, take a more relaxed view of local uh, debt for a couple of reasons. First, it is likely to be governed by domestic law. And the local legislature, if need be, can change that law to impose a debt restructuring uh, on those instruments. Second, of course, the country prints that currency. And while there always will be an inflation risk and fear, uh, some countries will have some maneuvering room in their ability to print the currency. And we've seen the phenomenon in the last year uh, of central banks in developing countries being prepared to replicate uh, 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 what looks like quantitative easing by buying debt instruments of their own host governments. Uh, the one point I would make on, on the balance of payments and capital control issues, traditionally when the IMF comes into a, an emerging market uh, country that has an unsustainable debt program, traditionally the first thing they say is devalue your currency. Uh, devaluing the currency both enhances exports, and so that will, all other things being equal, increase the inflow of foreign exchange into the country, but it also, of course, makes imports that much more expensive. And so there is a re uh, contraction uh, in the amount of foreign currency that locals are uh, seeking from the central bank in order to pay for their imports. Marissa's question about uh, uh, mechanisms for the private sector, I'll say a couple of things. First, uh, private sector investors, very often now hedge funds uh, or similar investment vehicles, traditionally will form a creditors committee uh, in which they will purport is to be representative of the creditor class and through that they will attempt to negotiate the terms of the, the debt uh, restructuring. The collective action clauses that were introduced into New York law sovereign bonds only beginning in 2003, in fact, have a fascinating history. They go back, the first such collective action clause was introduced in England in 1879 in the corporate context because it was clear in the 19th century when you had mostly railroads as large issuers of bonds, in those days, there was no chapter 11. Uh, the alternative, if a railroad couldn't pay its debts, was either pay them in full or liquidate in full. Those were the two alternatives. So an English barrister by the name of Francis Beaufort Palmer decided, I'm going to try to put into a bond a contractual provision, which says that a supermajority of holders of this bonds, if they can sense to a debt restructuring bind any dissenting minority. Uh, and it was quite an innovative clause. It was immediately litigated in the English courts, but upheld. But that was the precedent uh, 
that we exhumed uh, in the early part of this century, post the Argentine default, uh, to try to find a way to facilitate sovereign bond restructurings without uh, holdout creditor problems. You ask about the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism and whether it will make a comeback. Many people have said uh, that uh, it is clear that the, the financial crises of this century show that a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism, a transnational bankruptcy code is needed. My own sense is that the political winds on the Potomac have not shifted very significantly in that regard. The Americans objected to the SDRM back in 2002 on the grounds that they feared that if private sector investors thought that the fate of their uh, uh, credits was going to ultimately rest with a political body like the executive board of the IMF that they would cease lending. Uh, I'm not sure that's true, by the way, but that's what the Americans said at the time. And I, I, it's very early days of the Biden administration, and I don't want to prejudge what they might think about this, but, but uh, I'm until the end of the last administration, there was not any significant relaxation of their skepticism, put it that way, about a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. Okay, we have questions now from Professor Schenk, uh, from Louise, and from Randy. Randy is my mentor at Millbank. I'm very happy to see you here. So. Professor Schenk, it's yours, the mic. Thank you very much. Um, my question, you, you raised the, um, the links between Paris Club and private creditors and the, the need for uh, debtors to, to make settlements um, commensurately with private creditors. Um, I've noticed that the share of uh, sovereign debt to banks is increasing, uh, particularly for the poorest countries. And I wonder if that draws us back into whether the 1980s bank type restructuring um, may be becoming more relevant. Um, and whether you're thinking or you're aware that there might be greater vulnerabilities in the balance sheets of banks who are exposed to these countries. And I'm, I kind of always thought it was quite a lot of Chinese banks lending uh, to these poor countries. And of course the Chinese banking system uh, has its problems. Um, and when I think about the bank restructurings in the 1980s, they were packages, so it was not just the sovereign debt that was restructured, but the lines of credit, the trade credit, the lending to semi-sovereign corporations. So it was, in a sense, a more kind of comprehensive type of deal that you could get rather than um, just bond, bond restructuring. Mm -hmm. Louise, do you want to come on? Uh Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, Venezuela and in particular about uh, PDBSA 2020 bonds and the opportunity for creditors to seize Citigo assets. And I was wondering how do you see the role of call out creditors in Venezuela? And I also wonder if you're, you could comment on your proposal from 2017 about the role of uh, how to deter and hold out creators in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. Randy. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this very interesting discussion. And I want to thank Maria for inviting me. Um, sovereign bonds aren't my focus. Uh, I'm, I'm more into corporate bonds, but I am Lebanese. And uh, you may be familiar, we are going through our uh, own so sovereign bond crisis right now. Um, last year, Lebanon defaulted on its first sovereign bond in, in its history. And you mentioned collective action clauses. Uh, I think Lebanon was one of the first countries to adopt collective action clauses in its um, earlier bonds earlier in um, this, uh, this century. But um, those clauses are, as you may be familiar, they're, they're dual limb, they're not single limb, meaning they don't allow for um, a restructuring across all of the outstanding bonds. They're only bond by bond. Um, so I was wondering how you'd see a situation like that playing out. 
in the corporate bond world, at least, we would probably find some form of um, liability management exercises, some uh, coercive exchange offers, uh, you know, some exit consents. You know, we don't have to go through the details of them, but do, do you see things like that in the sovereign bond uh, world? And and one other like sort of related question, I don't know how familiar you are with the Lebanese sovereign bonds, but they, they do have a very interesting uh, pari passu clause. Um, where you know the, the sovereign bonds are deemed to be pari passu with all obligations of the Lebanese Republic, except those that are preferred by under Lebanese law, and that exception is is quite unique. I don't think it's it's one that that, or at least I've, my understanding is that it's quite unique. How how broadly do you think that exception could be used? So could the could the Lebanese Parliament pass a law to favor certain creditors over others using that you know quite broad exception? And, and use that in conjunction with a course of exchange offer, do you think? Or, sorry, maybe my, maybe my question is quite technical and I apologize for like barging in with it, but if, if you do have insights, that'll be really helpful. Sure. Uh, okay, there's a lot there. Professor Sheng, uh, when the Brady plan unfolded in the early 90s, uh, the commercial banks said <laughs> that we will treat this as a long sloppy goodbye kiss. Uh, we will not, we bankers will not return to the happy days of naked balance of payments financing for emerging market countries of the kind that they had done uh, starting in the mid 1970s. And it was true, they did not return to that. Um, they did stay in the lending business in trade finance uh, and in project finance, both of which are typically secured or quasi secured. Oh, there is one fascinating aspect of, of what has happened over the last 40 years. In the 1980s, when emerging market sovereigns borrowed the amount of bond indebtedness they had on their balance sheets was utterly negligible. Uh, in December of 1982, the first meeting of the Bank Advisory Committee for Mexico, Mexico in extremis had issued two bonds with a 17% fixed rate interest rate. Uh, the question before the Bank Advisory Committee was, ought we to force Mexico to restructure these bonds? Uh, Mexico said, it isn't worth the candle. Uh, we don't know who holds them. Uh, we have no mechanism to force people to restructure them. With you bankers, we can call the Federal Reserve and they'll bring you in line if needed. And so bonds were excluded from the debt restructurings of the 1980s in all but two countries. And <laughs> I remember saying at the time, uh, look, at such time as bonds become the principal component of the commercial debt stock of a country, their inviolability from debt restructuring is going to be punctured. And of course, it was starting in 1999 with three countries. Uh, and of course, that's been the pattern since. But what's interesting is, I wonder whether we'll see an inversion where commercial bank loans outside of the trade and project finance areas may be a relative rarity and for at least a little while, who knows, maybe even will enjoy uh, the uh, uh, exemption from future debt restructurings that their bond colleagues enjoyed uh, back in uh, in the 1980s. There is a very burning question right now in the context of the DSSI and the common framework. China, when the DSSI was being drafted, was probably the country most insistent that commercial creditors, uh, hang on one second. I fear I'm going to run out of juice here. The, uh, most, uh, they were most insistent that they, the commercial creditors come in. Of course, the commercial creditors did not. And the Chinese reaction to that was to say that their state-owned banks, C uh, CDB and China, XM and so forth, were to be treated as commercial creditors. Have I lost you folks? <laughs> 
No, the app's still no. here. Okay, good. If I do, I'm going to dial back in on my cell phone. So do, do, do. Um, right now, under the common framework, the issue that's being debated is, will China commit to restructure only its uh, state credits or will it force its, its banks to, to come in? The comment was correctly made in the 1980s. It wasn't just medium term unsecured bank loans that were brought in. Trade finance was brought in, interbank lines were, were brought in. Venezuela, as a matter of disclosure, let me say I'm an advisor to the Guaido regime in Venezuela. So if what I say has a tincture of partisanship, I hope you'll forgive it. Um, the state-owned oil company in Venezuela, PDVSA, uh, Maduro issued one series of bonds uh, that matured in 2020 that were secured by a pledge of 50.1% of the shares of Citco. Citco is the third largest refinery in the United States. It is, it is the crown jewel of the Venezuelan external assets. Um, th those holders uh, could foreclose on their pledge and pay themselves out. What is stopping them at the moment is a Trump era restriction issued under the Office of Foreign Asset Controls, OFAC, which prohibits anyone from foreclosing or a, a, a seizing Venezuelan property in the United States. The big issue is will, uh, will the Biden administration continue those blocking positions? And if so, for how long? And no one knows that it is a matter of acute concern uh, to the Guaido administration. Um, uh, I did have a proposal uh, back in 2017 for how to deal with holdout creditors in Venezuela. Um, I'm afraid it's, it's, it's probably too complicated to, to discuss in this forum, particularly if my battery is running out. Uh, Randy's comment on Lebanon. Uh, <laughs> And if I can finish talking about Lebanon without weeping, uh, 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 I will be surprised. The situation in, in Lebanon is particularly grave, but made honestly more serious by the fact that they don't have a functioning government. And you need such a government in order to begin the process of a debt restructuring. Why? Because the IMF cannot deal with uh, uh, must have a counterparty, an interlocutor to their uh, discussions about a program, and particularly in the case of Lebanon, a country which enjoys considerable geopolitical support. Um, uh, the, the Lebanese diaspora uh, is enormously successful, um, but without a government uh, that bilateral uh, 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 partners uh, can deal with, uh, th that tends to get uh, uh, frustrated. Let me say one thing about this Paripasu. It, it is an unusual but not unique Paripasu. It appears in about 20% of English law bonds, and it was a fallacy from the very beginning. You see, the Paripasu clause in corporate bonds traditionally says these bonds rank equally with all other obligations except for those uh, preferred by law. The reason that's in corporate law bonds is all insolvency regimes will have senior creditors like the taxman. Um, and of course, you're not promising to elevate a, a, a commercial debtor to the level of the taxman. So it makes sense somebody probably at three in the morning, copied the uh, corporate uh, Paripasu clause and put it into a sovereign bond where it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The clause appears in the bonds of another country that I had 
uh, to deal with, and they were English law bonds. I went to a Queen's Council to ask whether an English court would in fact give the clause the reading that, uh, that you're asking about here. He wasn't sure, but he thought they just might. I have my doubts that an, uh, a, a homespun American Yankee judge <laughs> would do that. Uh, I think uh, because you see, if you interpret it, Randy, literally, yeah. then the Pariso Clause means nothing. It's got it. I agree. I agree. Be but it, it is interesting. It's there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fascinating. And mm. if you send me an email, I can put you in touch with some folks who have studied yeah. this. I, I'm, not, I'm not working on the matter, but it's interesting. Okay. It's super interesting. Okay. It's super interesting. Yeah. How are we doing with your battery and with time? Is there to be one? I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm fine as long as the battery lasts. And again, if you give me a few minutes, I can probably dial back in on a cell phone. But Okay, let's do one short last round of questions and then um, we will release you from this q okay. We will have uh, Alex, Samuel, Chris, and then Rudy. Hi, yeah, so uh, it's a really interesting story about how going into the 1980s, countries were borrowing at floating rates and then Volcker raising the interest rates kind of kicked off debt crises in these countries. Um, you talked about countries potentially being inoculated against borrowing at variable rates or borrowing in foreign cu currencies. Uh, and I'm wondering about, so today, if countries are borrowing in the bond market and kind of perpetually rolling over or refinancing that debt, is that in some ways similar to borrowing at a floating rate? Um, or is it different because they can always borrow more to pay the higher interest rates? And if they can, then what's the risk that sovereign debtors face today um, when interest rates come back up from zero? Uh, you're talking about like a grave risk there. Is it mostly a credit rating issue? Will they ever reach a point where they're not able to refinance or roll over their debt anymore? And then to what extent is borrowing in foreign debt really a choice that governments can make for themselves? Why would they ever choose to borrow in a foreign cu currency if they could borrow domestically? Is it to keep domestic interest rates down or like, can you say more about that? Okay. Samuel? Uh, yeah, thank you. Greetings from Mexico and apologies if you hear a baby cry, but I'm on baby duty at the moment. Um, okay. So um, I, I had a question concerning the role of negotiability uh, of financial instruments and the, you know, the creditor hierarchy, hierarchy that they have, because we were talking about creditor diversity, right? One of the key issues that was happening, for instance, during the global financial crisis is that there was a lot of contestation about uh, CDS, right? And their status about whether they were negotiable or not and so on. And so I was wondering in terms if the negotiability, for instance, of bonds and its special status, I'm not talking about transferability like economists do when they talk about negotiability, but I'm specifically talking about this specific Anglo-American stuff called uh, um, negotiability, uh, you know, that uh, how it impacts also the capacity of negotiate with the different types of creditors that sovereign debt, uh, sovereign debtors or sovereign issuers have. Okay. Okay. So, Chris, do you want to come on? Yeah. Thanks. So, um, so my question is, uh, with or without um, restructuring, uh, sovereign debt restructuring, do you think potential lenders expect? future borrowing of emerging market sovereigns to be repaid, or are they going to rely on somebody else allowing them to roll over the loans? And then the, the last question is uh, from Rudy. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, let me first present myself. I'm a master's student at Levy Economics Institute at Bard College. I'm from Lebanon. We've been discussing the been talking about the Lebanese crisis. So my question is, is there any precedent that uh, we know uh, uh, that uh, to get out of the financial crisis, they had to devalue their currency, to readjust their balance of payment without doing a debt uh, restructuring? We know of any precedent uh, that a country can, has been able to do that without doing a debt restructuring. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me take those in the 
order first, Alex. Um, the risk uh, in the bond uh, for countries that have borrowed in the bond market is not so much uh, interest rates, although it is a risk, but it's a risk. It's, it's, it's not like the old LIBOR based commercial bank loans where LIBOR adjusted every day. Uh, for countries that borrow in the bond market, typically those are fixed rate bonds, but for the term obviously of that bond. The risk is uh, that this period of ultra accommodative monetary policy will not last forever. Uh, and when those instruments mature, if interest rates begin to creep up, the refinancing of them is going to be that much more expensive. And frankly, if you were to pro forma emerging market borrowing, today at interest rates that are the historic norms for those countries, the debt stocks of most of these countries would be utterly unsustainable. And by the way, that applies to the developed world um, as well. You also ask why not borrow domestically? There are often constraints on that. The capital markets in many of these countries are quite shallow and the government often does not want to uh, try uh, uh, to cover its budget deficits through domestic borrowing because it will crowd out corporates uh, and raise interest rates uh, generally. Uh, the question of bond negotiability is absolutely fascinating and it's one of the issues that is rarely talked about. Uh, it is of course a characteristic of a negotiable instrument uh, that any defenses that the debtor may have to the uh, uh, personal defenses against the original creditor uh, are washed away as that instrument trades in the market. So what we call, what American law calls a holder in due course will acquire the debt instrument free from personal defenses. The relevance of this is uh, and it's particularly true right now in the Venezuelan case, but has been true, uh, was certainly true in Iraq and a number of others, uh, where borrowing. Sorry, how can we mute this? Sorry. Yeah, where borrowings have been incurred by regimes that are corrupt uh, and therefore arguably can be categorized as odious debts, uh, uh, is it really true that if that debt instrument is sold to an, an unsuspecting innocent holder that uh, a new administration in the debtor country taking over from the tyrannical corrupt regime cannot object to that debt instrument? So it is a fascinating legal question rarely actually uh, discussed. Um, the, the, the issue in this, this is a variation on the assumption of, of uh, refinancing. The risk is, well, let me, let me, just, Maria said, we're sitting around the campfire. I don't want to throw too large a log on that fire. Uh, but you hear people today say uh, at, at very high levels, uh, borrow as much as you can. Don't worry about it. Uh, interest rates are so low, it would be irresponsible for a politician not to borrow as much money as they possibly can. There is, of course, a fallacy embedded in that uh, when they say interest rates are very low, borrow as much as you can, the connotation, the implicit uh, statement is that the country will be squirreling away the money it needs to repay that debt before maturity. Uh, and of course, that is absolutely fatuous. Uh, no country does that. Uh, they assume they'll be able to refinance it. And so the relevance of low interest rates in 2021 
uh, may not uh, be very persuasive if when the bond matures in 2027, uh, monetary policy has uh, uh, begun to return to what we think of as normal, because at that point, the refinancing will be more expensive and perhaps, perhaps uh, ruinously uh, more expensive. Uh, I'm sure there have been circumstances in which countries have been able to devalue and by that step alone, avoid a debt restructuring. But I, uh, I'm not a good enough economist to be able to point you to those instances, um, but I'm sure that happens. It, I, I will repeat something I said earlier. Every atom of the political flesh will try to evade and defer the need for a debt restructuring. So if they thought they could get away with a devaluation uh, as the means of avoiding the unpleasantry of a debt restructuring, they would be politically motivated to do so. And I'm, it, it must be true that there are countries that have avoided it, but if, <laughs> think of it this way, if they have successfully avoided a debt restructuring, they never came on my radar screen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lee. Um, I'm getting messages at the side from people who are absolutely fascinated and um, sort of feeling the glow of our virtual campfire here. <laughs> um, I, so there was a question about um, career advice for students asp aspiring becoming restructuring lawyers. I'm, I'm going to para paraphrase this and, and to, so we can close with, with one last question. So, as we're all going away and venturing into 2021, where do you think um, as people walking around the planet with open eyes, should we look, where, is, where are the cracks in the system going to show up first? And what, what's the interesting space to, to watch when it comes to the G20 and these sovereign debt restructurings? Is there, is there anything you can give us um, with us on, on, our, on our path, maybe, you know, a news report or where do you think to watch? And is there any um, literature you want to recommend to us? I'm sure uh, you don't yeah. see you now. I think you, you stopped your I, camera. Well, uh, or that's the battery, I'm not sure. Yeah, let me see if I come back. Okay. Um, this, the, inter, the sovereign international financial system I regard as particularly fragile. Uh, it is fragile because of the colossal size of those debt stocks. It is fragile because of this assumption of refinancing uh, that can uh, 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 prove uh, to be uh, illusory, sometimes for reasons related to the debtor country, uh, but oftentimes for wholly extraneous reasons, some uh, uh, disturbing geopolitical event, a Lehman moment, uh, some debtor country halfway around the world gets into trouble and all of a sudden the investor community is reminded of the thousand shocks to which the uh, sovereign lending flesh is heir and they pull back. Or something like a pandemic or something like a variation on a virus frightens the market and all of a sudden they rush back into what they regard as safe investments uh, or uh, monetary authorities in developed countries begin to raise interest rates and all of a sudden investors that had lent to emerging markets for the yield can now earn a remunerative yield with less risk. This happened in 1994 when the Fed raised interest rates 11 times in that year. And in December of that year, the tequila crisis hit in Mexico because money was pouring out of emerging markets. We saw it last year in March with a sudden stop. Something like 90 billion uh, came out of the markets. So I regard the system as particularly fragile. And I fear uh, that 
uh, the overall effect of what has gone on may mean that uh, central banks will be motivated, uh, perhaps against their better judgment, to continue monetary policies simply because they dare not tighten them for fear of essentially bankrupting their own governments, but everybody else in the process. And what that would mean is a period of uh, negative real interest rates for quite a long time, uh, or a willingness to endure inflation, which if you are an historian, that is how most countries have gotten out of debt crises in the past. Uh, the, the last time this country, the United States, was in this position was the end of World War II, and we dealt with it largely by inflation. In 1947, I think inflation was over 14% in this country. So, uh, but you folks are mostly economists. You know uh, how pernicious inflation can be once it gets into an economy. But very interestingly, only someone who remembers the 1970s and early 1980s actually remembers uh, just how bad inflation can be. An entire generation or maybe two have grown up with no collective memory of the horrors of inflation and therefore politicians looking at their options, all disagreeable, uh, might decide that the best way to deal with sovereign debt problems in this decade is to permit inflation to run uh, more than sober economists would recommend, put it that way. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing your experience and your insight. It's been extraordinary. Um, and um, we wish you very well and um, hope to do this again at some point in the future. Anytime. I enjoyed it. Wonderful to be with you folks. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.